What is up, Ewu crew? Countless tragedies are witnessed playing out in courtrooms and through the legal system. And though it is impossible to compare what crimes are more heart-wrenching or distressing, most people can agree that wrongful convictions are especially tragic. Not only do families fail to receive justice for their loved ones in these cases, but someone else ends up imprisoned for a crime they didn't commit, receiving a punishment they don't deserve. Today, we are going to discuss three of the most compelling and truly shocking cases of wrongful convictions. Prepare yourself, because you're sure to be shaking your head in disbelief by the end of it. Just when you think you can't be surprised, we promise, you will be. Kirk Bloodsworth Born October 31st, 1960. Kirk Bloodsworth was a former Marine in his early 20s who was living on the eastern shore of Maryland in 1984, after he had been honorably discharged from service. He had begun work as a waterman where he spent his days harvesting shellfish and fish. But soon, everything changed, taking a dark turn for the worse, when in 1984, nine-year-old Don Hamilton was found dead in Rosedale, Maryland. Reportedly, Don had been at a sleepover with her friends and they had decided to play hide and seek in the woods. But when it was her turn to be it, Dawn was having trouble reconnecting with any of her pals. She asked two boys she knew who were fishing nearby to help her, but they turned her away. Then, a strange man appeared and offered to assist Dawn. This was the last time the little girl was seen alive. Kirk became a suspect in Dawn's death based off of an anonymous call the police had received, which stated that he had been seen with Dawn the day that she died. The caller had identified Kirk based off of a police sketch that another witness had described, which investigators then shared on TV. The witness who gave the description of the suspect in Don's death had said that the perpetrator was a white man with a tan and skinny build, about six foot five with curly blonde hair and wore their facial hair and a bushy mustache. However, Kirk himself was just six feet tall with red hair and was over 200 pounds at the time. Despite the fact that he did not match the description of the suspect, Kirk was eventually arrested. As soon as Kirk was in police custody, he was consistently adamant that he was innocent. Kirk would maintain his stance of innocence all through his ensuing trial. Though there was no physical evidence that could tie Kirk to the scene, he was taken to trial for Don's death based mostly on witness testimony that claimed to have seen him with Don and a few sketchy statements that he had reportedly made to the police. Police testimony said that Kirk had told them vaguely that he had done something terrible that day that would affect his relationship with his wife. He had also allegedly mentioned a bloody rock while talking to the police. At his trial, five separate witnesses testified that it had been Kirk who they saw with Dawn. But there is some contention, as when two of the witnesses were presented with a lineup, they couldn't identify Kirk. As well, after the lineup, these same two witnesses admitted to having seen Kirk's face during newscasts about the crime and recognized his face from there. Even without physical evidence, these witness testimonies, along with his own allegedly incriminating comments, were used to find Kirk Bloodsworth guilty. He was convicted of assault and first degree premeditated murder in 1985. He was sentenced to death. Reportedly, people were celebrating and saying, give him the gas and kick his ass. As Kirk maintained that he was innocent, he had multiple appeals where the sketchy statements he had made were challenged. His defense explained that Kirk only mentioned the bloody rock because he had been shown a rock during his interrogation and that the incident he was referring to with his wife was that he hadn't bought the food she requested. As well, at the time, police failed to mention to Kirk's defense that there was also another suspect. 
something that wasn't brought up during his trial, but may have helped his defense during his many appeals. In 1987, at the Court of Appeals, Kirk's original conviction was overturned, and he was given the retrial which he desperately wanted. However, it failed to turn out the way he expected. Rather than being found not guilty, Kirk was sentenced to two life terms. Though still a bleak outcome, it was an improvement from death row. While in jail, Kirk never lost hope that he could one day prove he was innocent. And in 1992, he read about how DNA testing was used for the conviction of Colin Pitchfork in England for the killings of Don Ashworth and Linda Mann. The DNA evidence was used to exonerate the previous suspect who had falsely confessed. Kirk realized that emerging forensic DNA technology could possibly be used in his own case, and he began campaigning to have the biological evidence collected at the crime scene tested. Traces of semen had been collected from Don's underwear, but at first it was believed that it had been destroyed at some point. Eventually, it was found in a paper bag in the judge's chambers. The underwear, along with shorts, a stick found at the crime scene, and an autopsy slide were finally tested and compared against Kirk's DNA. The DNA of the suspect was found conclusively not to match Kirk's, and the test was replicated by the FBI, which found the same result. After eight years, 10 months, and 19 days spent in prison, with a total of two years on death row, Kirk Bloodsworth was released from prison in 1993. Though this was clearly a victory for Kirk's innocence, he was still not fully exonerated. It wasn't until 2003, almost an entire decade after he was released, that the real killer was found. When prisoner DNA was finally added to both state and federal databases, Kimberly Shea Ruffner came back as a match to the DNA found on Dawn. Ruffner had been incarcerated for an unrelated burglary, which was how his DNA ended up in the system. In a strange coincidence, Ruffner had actually been incarcerated in a cell one floor below Kirk's own cell while he had been in prison. The two men had even seen each other a few times. In 2004, Ruffner was charged with Dawn's death and he pled guilty. Kirk later lamented that five months before he was released, his mother had passed away, and he had only got to see her at the funeral for five minutes in his chains, handcuffs, and shackles. He reportedly received $300,000 from the government as compensation for the time he was unfairly locked in prison. He says reintegrating into society has been a challenge, especially dating. He has explained, one woman asked me, where have you been for the past nine years? In jail, I told her, but I didn't do it. Can you pass the salt? Since becoming the first death row inmate to be exonerated using DNA evidence, Kirk has worked with the Justice Project, Witness to Innocence, and helped to support the Innocence Protection Act of 2003 in a bid to spread awareness about the dire consequences of false convictions and hopefully prevent someone else from having to suffer the same undue punishment that he did. Anthony Porter. Our second case today is one that contains many elements that easily could have been the plot of a movie, but unfortunately, it is all real. Born in 1955, Anthony Porter lived most of his life in Chicago. His life wasn't easy, and by the age of 27, he had allegedly joined a gang. On August 15, 1982, around 1 a.m., two teenagers were shot on the south side of Chicago. 19-year-old Marilyn Green and her fiance, 18-year-old Jerry Hillard, had both died from the gunshot wounds they received near a swimming pool in Washington Park. The suspected perpetrator was seen fleeing the crime scene by multiple witnesses. The perpetrator stole Marilyn's money and jewelry, leading investigators to believe that the motive in the shooting was robbery. William Taylor, who had actually been in the swimming pool at the time of the shooting, reported that he had seen Anthony Porter running by soon after he heard the gunshots. 
At first, Taylor reported to police that he hadn't witnessed the shooting itself, but later he changed his story to say that he had indeed seen Anthony fire the shots which killed Marilyn and Jerry. Five other witnesses came forward and identified Anthony, and one witness even included that they recognized him because they had reportedly been robbed at gunpoint by Anthony in the park before the shooting. Though there were other suspects, it appeared that police believed Anthony was the only lead worth pursuing. After Anthony heard that his name was being considered in relation to the two deaths, he turned himself into the police in the hopes of setting the record straight and clearing the suspicion on him. Rather than believing his declaration of innocence, police arrested and charged him with two murders, one count of armed robbery, one count of unlawful restraint, and two counts of unlawful use of weapons. The ensuing trial was short, and Anthony was quickly convicted and sentenced to death in 1983. Judge Robert L. Sklodowski referred to Anthony as a perverse shark at his trial. Despite the guilty sentence, Anthony claimed that he was innocent and immediately started campaigning for appeals, each of which was continually denied, but worked to help delay his execution. His defense team worked tirelessly to prove his innocence, but seemingly to no avail. They arranged for a testing of his mental capacity in 1995, and Anthony was found to have an IQ of 51, which characterized him as intellectually disabled. They attempted to appeal once again based on this information, arguing that their client was incapable of comprehending the full nature of his punishment. However, this effort wouldn't pay off until further down the road. In 1998, Anthony was scheduled to be executed, and his defense once again sought another appeal. Exactly 48 hours before he was due to be executed, Anthony was granted a miracle stay of execution, and just in time. It seems that the Illinois Supreme Court agreed that time should be taken to determine if Anthony was able to understand the full gravity of the death sentence. Because of the stay of execution, David Protes, a professor at Northwestern University, had the ability to assign Anthony Porter's case to his class as an assignment for the Innocence Project of the Medill School of Journalism. The students rallied together and began an in-depth investigation into Anthony's case. They found evidence that exposed flaws in Anthony's prosecution, and when interviewed by students, William Taylor, who had claimed to identify Anthony, recanted his original statement. Taylor even went so far as to claim that he had been threatened, harassed, and intimidated by the police to accuse Anthony. Along with this new evidence, in 1999, a woman named Inez Jackson came forward to testify against her estranged husband, Al Story Simon. Simon had been in Chicago in the 1980s, and Inez claimed that she had even been with Simon when he allegedly killed Jerry and Marilyn, because Jerry had been, quote, skimming money from drug deals. Her claims were corroborated by her nephew. Four days later, Simon went to the police and confessed, apparently asserting that he killed Hillard in self-defense after an argument over drug money and that Marilyn's shooting had been an accident. A new investigation was launched, utilizing some of the evidence collected by the Innocence Project, and Anthony was released from prison on bail. After 17 years on death row, narrowly escaping execution, Anthony Porter had all charges dropped against him. In 1999, Al Story pled guilty to second-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter. Though Anthony Porter's story ends here, the case did not. In 2005, Inez and her nephew both recanted their stories. Simon also recanted his confession. Inez claimed that she had lied in order to obtain money, as well as get Professor David Protes from the Innocence Project to help her free her son from prison. Simon claimed that he was tricked into a confession and that he did not receive due process. 
He was eventually exonerated in 2014 after 15 years in prison. Marilyn Green and Jerry Hillard's deaths are still unsolved to this day. James Joseph Richardson. Our final case today is perhaps the most shocking and tragic of all. James Joseph Richardson, born in 1935, was a family man working as a migrant farm worker in Arcadia, Florida, with his wife, Annie Mae Richardson, and their expanse of seven children. Their children ranged in age from the oldest being eight-year-old Betty down to two-year-old James, with a child born every year in between. The middle children were Alice, Susie, Doreen, Vanessa, and Diane. Though Betty and Alice were from Annie Mae's previous marriage, James raised all seven children as if they were all his biologically. With such a big family, both James and Annie Mae worked hard to provide. In order to free up their time to work, the couple had their neighbor, a woman named Bessie Reese, look after all seven children when they were out. Another necessity of such a big family was planning ahead. Annie Mae often prepared the children's lunches the night before so that when Bessie came over, she had one less thing to worry about. The night of October 24th, 1967 was no different when Annie Mae made beans, rice, and grits and placed the meals in a locked refrigerator. On October 25th, the family went about their morning as usual, with James and Annie Mae heading off to work while Bessie came over to see the four oldest children to school and care for the younger ones. Later in the day, the four oldest children returned home from school for lunch, where they ate the prepared meal. But something strange happened when they went back to school that afternoon. All of the children's teachers noticed that there was something off about the four Richardsons. They appeared to be incredibly sick. The principal had them immediately sent to the hospital. Concerned, one of the teachers also went to check on the three children at home and found them also to be displaying symptoms of illness. They were also taken to the hospital. James and Annie Mae were told that one of their children was sick and to come to the hospital, which they did, where they discovered the shocking and heart-wrenching news that six of their children had already passed away, with only three-year-old Diane still alive. She died later the next day. An immediate investigation began when police heard that seven children from the same family had died. Authorities assumed poisoning, but when the house and shed were repeatedly searched on the day of the six children's deaths, no poison was found, only an insect spray which was not believed to be involved. However, the children's poisoning appeared to be caused by a pesticide. The next day, a two-pound sack of parathion was found in the shed, and authorities agreed that it had not been there during a total of five previous searches. Parathion is an organic phosphate pesticide. When used as a poison, it attacks the central nervous system and fills the lungs with fluid. There are conflicting reports on how police discovered the parathion, but they were reportedly informed by an anonymous phone call from a male caller. Later that same day, it was alleged to reporters by the DeSoto County Sheriff's assistant, John Treadwell, that James had reportedly discussed insurance policies for the children the night before their deaths. Though it appeared that James had spoken to an insurance salesman, there were conflicting reports on what exactly was discussed regarding insurance policies. The shock of seven children's deaths gained national attention and during the funeral, both parents were witnessed collapsing in grief at the loss. With the nation's eyes on the case, Sheriff Klein reportedly saw the chance to make a big name for himself. Two days after the funeral, Klein arrested and charged James with the murder of all seven of his children. The police chief, Richard Barnard, disagreed with the call and said that there was no case against him and so the murder warrants were eventually dropped. 
but both James and Annie Mae were charged with child neglect. Despite the murder charges being dropped, Sheriff Klein went to a press conference where he alleged that James had five other children who he reported had also previously died under mysterious circumstances. The case ended up going to trial, where James was adamant that he was not only innocent, but that he would never hurt his children who he loved so much. Even when Klein allegedly told him that if he confessed, he would be let off easy, James refused to confess. Part of the evidence against him was his three cellmates who had been incarcerated with him at the Arcadia Jail, who all claimed to have heard him admit to killing his children. Pieces of the prosecution's evidence was given by Sheriff Klein, who again stated that James had killed his other children, this time saying that there was evidence at least three of his children had been killed and three others who had become ill but not died. Reportedly, no evidence beyond his testimony was given for this allegation. Bessie Reese, the babysitter, also gave testimony saying that she had divided up the prepared meal into seven parts for the children when they came home for lunch. No other questions about the food were asked, even though police had established that it was this meal that had likely contained the parathion. The insurance agent also spoke and testified that though he had visited the household the night before the children's deaths, there was no life policy put in place, despite Klein's claims otherwise. The jury took half an hour to deliberate before coming back with a unanimous verdict. Guilty and the recommendation of the death penalty. James Richardson was on death row for five years before a Supreme Court ruling in 1972 stated that death penalties in the US at the time were unconstitutional. His sentence was changed to life in prison. While James was in prison, still proclaiming his innocence, the author Mark Lane became interested in his case. He began investigating and based on what he discovered, he wrote a book titled Arcadia. The only surviving cellmate who had testified that he heard James admit to killing his children later recanted the statement. In 1988, Bessie Reese was living in a nursing home as she was suffering from Alzheimer's disease. There, she reportedly confessed on more than 100 occasions that she had been the one to poison and kill the seven Richardson children. She was said to tell the aides at the nursing home, quote, I gave them the food. I poisoned them. She never told anyone why she had done it. But because of her illness, the confessions were not taken seriously. She died from the disease in 1992. Lane didn't give up after publishing his book and campaigned to have James's case reopened. He even appeared on James's behalf to argue that a grievous injustice had been done to him as the wrong person was convicted for the Richardson children's deaths. On October 25th, 1989, a hearing was held where evidence was presented that allegedly showed a cover-up by Sheriff Klein and others who worked with him. The circuit judge Clifton Kelly agreed with Lane that James had not received a fair trial and released him from prison and into the custody of his attorneys after 21 years. Since being released, James has suffered from heart issues, requiring open heart surgery. He claims his health issues are caused by the prison food he ate for over 20 years and the constant stress. James eventually filed a lawsuit against DeSoto County for wrongful prosecution and settled for $150,000. It has since been estimated that due to Bill HB 227, which grants those who have been wrongfully convicted compensation for time served, James could be awarded $1.2 million. These three cases all serve as a reminder that the justice system can be flawed and show the importance of evidence. We can only hope that these men who have been wrongfully convicted and their families, along with those of the victims, receive full justice eventually. But we can't help but wonder, after hearing these stories, 
how many other wrongful convictions are out there?